So we're going to kick off a new sermon series today. I cannot believe we are now in the Lent season. The Lent season is upon us, which means that we are less than 40 days until Easter and the time leading up to Easter. And today we kick off this new sermon series called The Road to Easter, where we are going to be looking at the events that directly led to Jesus' death and resurrection. And today we're going to pick up in the story as Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem for the final time to celebrate the Passover festival. Now, remember, when he gets to Jerusalem for the Passover festival, at the end of the week, that week, he's going to be arrested, he's going to go through his sham trials, he's going to be crucified, and ultimately, he's going to be raised from the dead. And we're going to be looking at all of these events as Jesus uh, makes his way towards Jerusalem and toward the cross and the resurrection. So today, as we pick up the story, Jesus is on the road, journeying with his disciples on his way to Jerusalem. Now, part of the crowd that surrounds Jesus is a large group of other followers of Jesus who are following Jesus to Jerusalem for the Passover. There's also a lot of just uh, travelers, fellow pilgrims along the road. Remember, uh, Jews would, devout Jews would be traveling to Jerusalem along these roadways in order to celebrate the Passover festival. And so there's just a, a sea of humanity along these travel routes as they make their way towards their last stops. Today we're going to be in Jericho. He's going to stop in Jericho, and then there's going to be one more stop in Bethany, and then they're going to be entering into the city of Jerusalem. So we're going to pick up out of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. It says this, Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see, and his followers, and he followed Jesus down the road. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that you help us today as we look at this text. Thank you that we have um, this in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We have accounts of this healing, and I just pray that you'd speak to us by your Spirit as we work through this today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this, believe it or not, now, this is the final individual healing that is uh, written about in the Gospels, in, Ma- in the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is the final individual healing. Now, I'm going to give you a disclaimer. In a few weeks, we're going to talk about Lazarus being raised from the dead. So that miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead happens most likely in chronological order before today's message. Because we know after Lazarus was raised from the dead that Jesus went out for a while into the countryside because now he was being pursued uh, because there was an arrest warrant out for him. And he spends some time and then he travels back to the city. But I wanted to save Lazarus for us until the week before we look at the triumphal entry because of how connected the story of understanding the triumphal entry and what's happening with the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Okay, so this miracle here is really in the Gospel of Mark. It's recorded as the final individual healing that's taken place that Jesus did in the Gospels. So this is amazing. You have to think the very first miracle of Jesus that's recorded in the Gospel comes all the way up right outside Jesus' hometown of Nazareth in a little insignificant village called Cana, where Jesus turned water 
into wine in the Gospel of John. And now, here we are at the end of Jesus' ministry on the far opposite end of the land, now down in the low country of Jericho near the Dead Sea where Jesus is going to do his final miracle. Now, cursing a fig tree is also still in the book of Mark, but I'm not counting cursing the fig tree and healing someone who's blind as the same, okay? So Jesus does still do some more miracles along the way. So here, Jesus has spent the last three years filling the land with miraculous power. Jesus, from the north to the south, from the high land to the low land, has been doing miracles in every village, everywhere he went, even enabling his own disciples to heal the sick and cast out demons. You can just picture the the land would have been buzzing with the stories of what Jesus has done. He's healed people. It says everywhere he went, he was healing the sick. This was part of Jesus's regular routine in his ministry. And John even adds in the little epilogue of his gospel, just in case we didn't understand, it says John 21, 25, Jesus did many other things as well. If ever Every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So John adds, this is just a fraction of what Jesus did. So you have to think of of how many people have been healed, that all that were coming to him in places were being healed. And so healing and the talk of Jesus would have been everywhere. Through the years after Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit in the Jordan River when he was baptized by John the Baptist, he has displayed supernatural power all throughout the land. He has shown his power over disease, over demons, over death, over nature. He has even shown his absolute authority over the most sacred things in Jewish culture, things like the Sabbath and the law. And now he's on his way for this last time to Jerusalem where he's going to lay down his own life as a ransom for many. And yet, even though he's on this mission, the Bible's clear in all the Gospels, it talks about Jesus turning his gaze towards Jerusalem for this final time. He's on a mission. There's a a finite number of days left for Jesus. And yet, as we're going to discover, as Jesus reaches Jericho, he's still Jesus. And he's still full of compassion and mercy, and he's still able, even though he's on this mission, to be interrupted along his way. So let's look again at verse 46. It says this, and they reached Jericho, and there was a large crowd following him. Matthew actually uses the word in his gospel, there was a multitude of people following him. This crowd is this combination of all of these people who have heard about Jesus and who have seen him working miracles. In fact, just before this in Mark, he was out in the, uh, the region of Perea and he was healing the sick there too. So you just have to think, all these people are now surrounding Jesus. They're making their way down the road. And to add to that, they're heading towards Passover. This is like the, the highlight of the Jewish calendar, the most important season of the year. And they're making their way now This journey is a journey that they would have been very familiar with. And in fact, because of the way the land was broken up with the Samaritans living in the center chunk, in order to for safe travel, oftentimes the Jews from the north would cross over the Jordan River and would come down the east side of the river and they would cross back over at the city of Jericho. Now we know from Uh, Old Testament history, it is at this city of Jericho that the Israelites crossed over the Jordan River to enter into the promised land for the first time. The city of Jericho is in close proximity to the Jordan River in the Dead Sea Valley. In fact, I've got a map for you that I want to show you just to give you an idea. Jericho's on the far right-hand side. Jericho is next to the Dead Sea along the Jordan River. It is at 1,200 feet below sea level, 1,200 feet below sea level. Now, the journey from Jericho to Jerusalem, as you can see, Jerusalem over here on the left-hand side is straight uphill. Jerusalem is located at 3,700 feet, and there's only 20 miles of distance. So consider, in 20 miles, they're going to go almost 5,000 vertical feet from Jericho to Jerusalem, 
along the road. This is the road that Jesus tells the story about the Good Samaritan. It's the road where there's lots of difficulty, lots of challenge, a very famous route because again, the Jews would cross over the river there and they would make their way up. That's why when, they, when you read about Jesus going to Jerusalem, they're always referring to him going up to Jerusalem. That's because it was an up to, it was straight uphill to get there. Now, Jericho was a bustling city in Jesus' time. Jericho was fed by these springs. It had abundant water. There were aqueducts. It was a very uh, modern city for its day. And because it was a true oasis, it held a very large uh, uh, population. In fact, according to historians, it was known as a garden city. It was the city of palms. It was filled with palm trees and fruit trees of every kind. In fact, there was one specific bush known as the balsam bush that grew in Jericho that was sort of the wonder tree that they made medicine from for all the land that was found only there in Jericho. Almonds flourished there and rose plants. The city was so beautiful, get this, that the Roman emperor Mark Anthony gave the city of Jericho to the love of his life, Cleopatra, as a gift. So you kind of get the idea of how beautiful this city would have been. And according to the Jewish historian Josephus, it was the place where Herod had his favorite palace built. It was the place where Herod had his summer palace, the place that ultimately he would die one day, was there in this city of Jericho. It was a very wealthy, modern garden city. Now, Jesus has come to town, and this large crowd that is accompanying him is poured into Jericho. And the parade of people headed toward the Passover would have lasted for days leading up to the festival. So you could just imagine all the merchants gathered along the road. These people have made a long journey, and they're getting, they've got a day's, long day's hike left before they get to Jerusalem. So it's a place where travelers would have stopped, would have resupplied, would have rested before continuing the rest of their trip. And we're told that the people lined the streets because they got word that one of the travelers on the road is Jesus himself. Now, next week, we'll be looking at the story of Zacchaeus. And we're told in the story of Zacchaeus that there are so many people gathered to see Jesus come that Zacchaeus was forced to climb a tree in order to see over this massive crowd. So you can kind of picture this, this huge crowd gathered around and Jesus is traveling with this massive, as Matthew calls it, multitude heading toward the Passover. And people have gotten word that miracle worker, the one that some people are saying might even be the Messiah, is coming into our town today. And now I really want to focus our story in on one particular person from this point on. It's this blind beggar this blind beggar named Bartimaeus, a blind man who sat by the road. Now, by the road, if you were a beggar during this season would have been a good spot to be. By the road with all of these travelers. Let me tell you something. When you're in your own town, a beggar has a hard job to do because the same people see you every day, right? But when when there's a parade coming through of religious pilgrims headed towards the capital of Jerusalem, this would have been a good spot for a beggar to sit. It's a good spot because there's such a large crowd gathered. Now, we don't know about Bartimaeus, why he was blind. We don't know how long he had been blind, but we do know this. Blind people in this culture were reduced to begging because in the theology of the day, It meant if you were blind that you were under divine judgment. You were blind because God was punishing you or your family for something that had been done. We know this because in John 9, the disciples, when they see the man who was born blind, ask Jesus the question, who sinned? Was it this man or was it his parents? Who's responsible for this person's blindness? And so we know in the culture of the day that this blind man would have been alienated, would have been separated, would have been ostracized. He was at the bottom. He was below the peasants. He was below even unclean sinners because they viewed him as someone who was cursed. Luke 18, 36 says, when he heard the noise of a crowd going past, he asked, what is happening? 
So we know something different's happening. We know this crowd is different than just the regular parade of pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. Something that even a blind man can perceive, there's a change, something different. There's a different noise, there's a different buzz. And so he wants to know what's happening. And Luke 18, 37 tells us, they told him that Jesus the Nazarene is going by. Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Jesus, that's his proper name. That's the name he was given at birth. That's the name that the angel had told Mary to name him. Jesus is the name people knew him by. Of Nazareth, that's kind of the place that he came from. So Jesus would have been known by the people as Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus literally uh, is the name given because Jesus is going to be the one who saves. Jesus, Jehovah saves. That's Jesus' name. But interesting that the crowd tells the blind man that Jesus of Nazareth is coming, but when Bartimaeus hears this, that's not what he cries out. He cries out, Jesus, son of David. He begins to scream. In fact, Mark uses the verb carazo. It means to shout, and it's the strongest word they have. It's the word in Mark 5 that is used to describe the noise being made by a demon-possessed man. It's the word in Revelation chapter 12 that's used to describe the screams of a woman who's giving birth. It's very strong language, and blind Bartimaeus begins to cry out, to scream out, Jesus, son of David. Not Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus, son of David. Now, here's what I want to do throughout this message today. I want to show you something amazing about blind Bartimaeus. He was physically blind, but apparently he could see some things with more clarity than the other people around him. And so I want to fill in some blanks with you here about some things that Bartimaeus could see that everyone else had missed. And here's the first one. Bartimaeus could see that Jesus was the Christ. That Jesus was the Christ. He tries to be heard over all the noise of this crowd, over all the commotion. He shouts, Jesus! That's the name they're familiar with. But then he follows it with Son of David. That is the messianic title. And let me tell you, friends, he knew exactly what he was saying, and everyone else around him knew what he was saying too. Because look at how they respond to him. Oh, be quiet. Don't say that. The Messiah, the Christ. Bartimaeus was declaring that this Jesus, whom he had heard about, was the long-promised Messiah. He was David's son, David's long prophesied greater son, who would be the king that would bring fulfillment to all the promises that were made to David and made to Abraham. It was the most commonly used title in the day for the Messiah, the son of David. This is the reason why Matthew includes in Matthew chapter 1, if you need some real interesting reading, uh, Matthew chapter 1 includes the genealogy of Jesus. It shows us how Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, came from the line of David. It's the reason why Luke decided when he wrote his gospel to include his genealogy that comes to Mary to show that Mary also was of the line of David. To show that Jesus truly was the son of David. But Bartimaeus isn't just referring to Jesus' family tree here. He says that Jesus is the capital T, Son of David. This messianic title at its purest. Remember, the angel told Mary in Luke 1, 32, He will be great and He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give Him the throne of His father David, and He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So this is what Bartimaeus is declaring. This is what Bartimaeus is shouting out, screaming out. He is acknowledging that Jesus, the man in the street, is the long-awaited Messiah. Now you need to understand, friends, so few people in the gospel up to this point have said these words out loud. In fact, in Mark's gospel, Bartimaeus is the only one at this point who's used this title, Son of David. It's the only time, it's the first time it has appeared. By faith, 
blind Bartimaeus could see something that no one else could see. And what does he want? What does Bartimaeus want? Look at his next cry. He says, have mercy on me. So here is a man who recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah, and here is a man also who knows exactly what he needs. He needs mercy. And so here's the second thing that Bartimaeus could see. Bartimaeus could see that Jesus was his only hope. Bartimaeus could see Jesus was his only hope. And by the way, to show you just how Bartimaeus would be treated in their society, when he cries out for mercy, he doesn't get any sympathy or any mercy from the crowd, does he? What is their response? Be quiet. It says many of the people yelled at him. Be quiet. This isn't just one person saying, oh, be quiet. This is the crowd turning on Bartimaeus. Shut that guy up. Keep him quiet. Do you hear what he's saying? He's going to make us all get in trouble here. This guy is blind. God doesn't love him. He's under divine judgment. Somebody make him shut up. But what's Bartimaeus do? It has no effect on him whatsoever. The crowd is turned at him, telling him to be quiet. And in the Bible says, but he only shouted louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. See, there's only one way to really understand this man. He believes everything that he has heard about Jesus. And obviously, he's heard a lot. Enough to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Remember, Jesus has spent the last three years doing miracles all over the land, including healing people who were blind. Don't you think as a blind man like Bartimaeus that he's heard about Jesus, the man who heals people who are blind? Remember, Bethany is just a day's walk up the hill where Lazarus was raised from the dead. Don't you think Bartimaeus, a man born, or who's been blind, is aware that Jesus Christ is the answer? He's the solution. He's his only hope. And nothing is going to shut him up. He couldn't physically see Jesus. If he could, that might have affected his view. In fact, Jesus, the guy walking down the the road would have been covered in dust and dirt. He wouldn't have been in any royal robes. He wouldn't have been wearing any crown. He wouldn't have been carrying a scepter. His, his party was anything but royal. A bunch of fishermen and tax collectors. and pe- uh, I mean, this would have not been what anyone was expecting. It's why they struggled so much with Jesus as the Messiah. But Bartimaeus could see what no one else could see. And he refused to be silent. He knew what he needed. He needed mercy. And he was going to fight with everything he had to get that mercy. And he knew knew Jesus was his only hope. Verse 49, when Jesus heard him, he stopped. And I just need to say, if there's anything that jumps off the pages from the Gospels as you study them over and over, it's just the unbelievable compassion and love of Jesus. He's compassionate at every turn. He's on his way to the cross. And here he is, compassionate, stopping, allowing himself to be um, stopped, taken out of where he was going once again. And he says, tell him to come here. In fact, in Luke 18, 40, it says this, when Jesus heard him, he stopped and ordered that the man be brought to him. Jesus stopped and ordered that Bartimaeus be brought to him. He commanded it. Verse 49 says, so they called the blind man. Now look how the crowd changes here. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Suddenly, the crowd has changed their tune. Jesus' response to the man has changed the heart of the crowd, or at least they're ready to see another miracle that they've heard about. So how does Bartimaeus respond? Bartimaeus Verse 50, threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Bartimaeus threw aside his very most valuable, life-sustaining possession. His moneymaker, his warmth, 
his cloak, his coat, a beggar's most important and likely only possession. A beggar would have spread this cloak out along the ground in order to collect the charity. It's how he made his living. It's how he survived. And when Jesus says, come immediately, Bartimaeus throws his cloak aside. Because here's number three for you. Bartimaeus could see that there was no turning back. Bartimaeus had no plan B. He wasn't hedging his bets. He was totally convinced and certain that if Jesus the Messiah was calling him, then everything was about to change. There was no going back for Bartimaeus to the roadside. There was no going back to begging anymore. His identity was left behind. That cloak, once his most valuable possession, he wasn't going to need it anymore. And then verse 51, Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? Now, this may seem like an odd question. What do you want me to do to you, for you? This is a blind man asking, it's pretty obvious, right, Jesus, what he wants? But see, Jesus is giving Bartimaeus the opportunity to participate in this incredible miracle, and he's giving Bartimaeus the opportunity for everyone else to hear as he expresses his beautiful faith. See, what we're about to see is what Bartimaeus really believed about Jesus. Because Bartimaeus responds, my rabbi. Now your translation might have a different word. It might say, rabboni. Because actually Bartimaeus uses a different word here than the traditional word rabbi or teacher that we see Jesus referred to as all throughout Scripture. In fact, this word rabboni is only used one other time in Scripture. And it means master or my Lord and master. The only other time that this word rabbi is used in the Bible is when Mary goes to the garden after Jesus has been crucified and laid in the tomb. When Mary shows up and the tomb is empty and she sees a, uh, the gardener who she thinks has taken Jesus' body and then discovers that it's Jesus himself, she responds, Rabbani, my Lord, my Master. And now here, this man Jesus whom he believed was the Christ, the the son of David, has asked him what he wants. And his response is, you are my Lord. You are my master. I want to see. So what happens next? Verse 52. Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. And let me tell you, friends, this is more than just a blind man receiving his sight. There's more than just a physical healing taking place. Because Jesus, once again, he says more than just your faith has healed you. Jesus used the word sozo. It's the word which we get the word saved. He says your faith has saved you. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you well. Friends, think of the life transformation that's just taken place for Bartimaeus. He's come out of blindness into sight and out of his sin into salvation. The Bible tells us that he followed Jesus down the road. That from this point, Bartimaeus joined the followers of Jesus. So now, not only has he been given sight, think about what he got to see. Bartimaeus, a man who was blind, now can see. And what's he get to see? Well, he's going to get to travel up to Bethany. He's going to get to watch Jesus make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and see the crowds uh, laying palm branches. He's going to get to see Jesus in the city. He's going to get to see Jesus in the resurrection. The blind man is going to see some of the greatest events in all of history. See, many scholars actually believe The reason that we know Bartimaeus' name, that Mark names Bartimaeus, because you know that there's only one miracle in the Gospel of Mark where we're told the person's name. 
In every other place, we're told, and Jesus healed those who were sick, or that Jesus was healing, or that the paralyzed man was lowered down, or that Peter's mother-in-law, or Jairus' daughter, we're never told the name of somebody who's healed, except for here in Mark's gospel, Bartimaeus. Why? Well, many scholars believe the reason why is the early church who was reading these letters knew Bartimaeus well because Bartimaeus became a follower of Jesus. Bartimaeus was known amongst the early church because the Bible says he followed them down the road. I believe Bartimaeus was likely there on Pentecost Sunday, the day the Holy Spirit was poured out and the 120 in the upper room were praising the Lord. I believe that God took this blind man and gave him a future that was bigger than what he could have ever asked for or imagined. Look at his response, by the way. Luke 18, 43. It says, instantly, the man could see and he followed Jesus, praising God. And all who saw it praised God too. So what's Bartimaeus become? He's become a worship leader. Can you grasp this, friends? This man who everyone tried to ignore, who everyone tried to avoid, this beggar that everyone begged to shut up, is now leading people in praise of God. He's leading people down the road and others are joining in and worshiping God because of what they've just eyewitnessed God do in his life. They're praising on because of what they see happening in Bartimaeus's life. One of the things that I love, I told you, the first time you hear the word son of David in the story in Mark is right here, out of the mouth of Bartimaeus. But guess what? In less than a week, when Jesus goes into the city, guess what the crowd is shouting? Son of David. I think Bartimaeus is a big part of that story. Bartimaeus is praising. People are hearing. This is, now remember, Jesus has been hiding out because it says that they were pursuing. He had an arrest warrant in his name. So he had to lay low. Public ministry had to come to an end. But now as he approaches the city for the last time, he's coming through Jericho and the compassion of Jesus, it would have made way more sense for Jesus to just skip through town, gone around Jericho. Don't, don't, don't become too visible, but what's Jesus do? In the middle of the road, surrounded by a multitude of people, he heals blind Bartimaeus. And now Bartimaeus joins with him in this incredible journey toward the city of Jerusalem. Band, I'm going to ask for you to come. There are several lessons that I want us to see here. I want us to see just how compassionate Jesus is. I want you to see that Jesus never ignores the cries of hearts that are turned towards him. I want us to see over and over throughout Jesus' ministry that he not only had the power to heal disease, but that he was willing. And I want you to see not only that he had the power to help sinners, he was, he, he was seeking out and searching for people whom he could join into his kingdom. You know, that's why you and I are here right now today. Because at some point in your life, you were blind. And you were seated along the road. And in desperation, as Jesus drew near to you, and your hearts were awakened, you cried out, Jesus, Son of David, Jesus, Lord, would you save me? Let me ask you a question. Have you seen what Bartimaeus saw so clearly? Are you fully convinced that Jesus is who he said he was? And are you fully convinced that Jesus will do for you what he says he will do for you? Are you simply trusting Jesus for that one day when you die and enter into his kingdom? Or do you believe that Jesus wants to do for you today what he said in scripture he wants to do for you today? Because see friends, Bartimaeus was willing to to cast everything else aside in order to pursue Jesus, in order to take hold of Jesus. My question for you today, friends, Jesus is passing by, and my question for you is what do you need? If he were to ask you the question he asked Jesus, he asked Bartimaeus today, if Jesus were to say to you in this room today, what do you want me to do? Do you have an answer? 
Do you need saving? Do you need healing? Do you need provision? Do you need wisdom? Do you need a Lord, someone that you can follow and give your life to? Because Jesus is passing by, friends. And he's asking the question. It's echoing down through eternity. What do you want me to do? And the question is, friends, what do you make of Jesus? Who do you say he is? Because if you're like the crowd who was there, it was all interesting. It was all fine. But Bartimaeus saw Jesus differently. He knew he was desperate for God's mercy. Friends, Do you feel a desperation in your life? Do you feel desperate to experience the kingdom of God today? Or is life just all right? It's pretty good. Because friends, I think we have settled in this life for just pretty good. When Jesus has come along the road and said, I've got more for you than that. You can follow me. You can experience the more of my kingdom. I've got kingdom power and kingdom life available for you. Do you want that? So I just want to ask you, friends, as we begin to worship, as we respond today, I just want to ask you, as you hear the Lord say to you today, what do you want me to do? Do you have an answer? You know what you want. And if you do, then maybe you would spend some time talking to the Lord this morning. Jesus says you have not because you ask not. And so some of you feel like, well, I have asked before, so I don't want to bother Jesus with it. Is that how Bartimaeus felt about it? No, he he was, that nothing was going to hold him back. So let's go after the Lord this morning.